All right. Well, my uh, my clock just struck uh, ten, and so that's uh-huh. our that's, that's our your witching, time, huh? That's the our witching, witching hour. hour. Okay. And so I'm I'm very happy just to uh, introduce Ray here. I've known Ray for quite a while at MIT. Uh, an interesting guy. Um, you know, to hear how he got to MIT, how he even got to get started in LIGO. Those are all interesting stories. But he's going to talk to us today about LIGO and the discoveries that it has made. And so I'm really happy to have you here, Ray. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm very glad to be here. And I, I, I ran into Charlie at a 90th birthday party for uh, Dan Kleppner and a chemist from Harvard. Uh, you know, very fancy folk that he was dealing with. And I was a bum having crawled in from the side. Anyway, uh, as I say, this is a talk that is really given on behalf of a, a big collaboration. And uh, let me see if I can show you the collaboration a little bit. That's it right there. There's about 60, maybe now 70 institutions in this collaboration and uh, probably around a thousand people and they cover the world. And what do they do? The, the smallest of them, smallest group makes the detector work. Most of them do data analysis. And uh, that's what, the, in fact, that's what the body of the work is. And so you'll find a lot of people here who are doing theory. And it's important for everybody. So I'm assuming you know very little about this. And I, I, by the way, this talk is not new. It was given to uh, the Ukrainian Academy of Junior Scientists just shortly after the Russians invaded. And uh, I was at the behest of the ambassador of Ukraine. And uh, so I'm very pleased that it, it turned out it wasn't totally, un- it was understandable, let's put it that way. So I hope it's again, understandable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see, I hope I can get this thing to go. Why does it, yeah. Well, here is our, here is our old friend. Uh, and Isaac was, in fact, we all of us know Isaac's equation. And this is the basis of gravity as we teach it even now in colleges. I mean, this is the basis of Newton's gravity, which is that there's a force between masses, M1 and M2. There's some constant that depends on the units. And the force gets smaller as a square of the distance between the masses. And that is a remarkably powerful relationship. Uh, it explains as much as most of what we need for space travel. It explains the tides, but it has some problems in a modern setting. In a modern setting, it doesn't work for very high velocities because you have to worry about Einstein for that. And it doesn't work at all when one wants to try to figure out how does communication travel within that field of gravity. In In other words, what I mean by that is imagine an experiment, which is just as crazy as about what am I, any, anything else on the talk about. Suppose you, we're watching from another, from another solar system, we're watching the sun suddenly being plucked away from the earth. And what, what, what we, how long would it take before we saw the earth no longer going around a circle around the sun? I mean, in other words, becoming tangent to that circle. And in Newton's theory, and it would be instantaneous. Now, I know that this was a very worrisome thing for even even for Newton, but that's the best answer people could give. And that's the wrong answer. And that is in part what gravitational waves are. And they are a way of communicating within a gravitational field. And I wanna show you a little about that. So the next theory is, uh, is the one of Albert. And Here, the equation is unbelievably difficult, but extremely simple to write. Uh, This is an equation which says something very powerful. It says that the geometry, the geometry of space and time is determined by the distribution of matter and energy, or really energy and matter, okay. And that a pi is, again, a units problem. So it turns out this is a completely different field. There are no gravitational forces anymore. You have done something to the geometry of space and time by virtue of having matter in it. And let me give you a little bit of kind of an example of that as best as I can. Uh, Imagine that you have laid out a jungle gym uh, and the jungle gym is this nice coordinate system that I see when you're far away from this hot glowing thing, which is the sun and this little ball, which is the earth. 
when you're far away from them, the, and I haven't done this because I was lazy, I didn't put clocks at each intersection point of the jungle gym. But if I had, they would all be reading the same time at the same moment in time. That doesn't mean that when you take a picture of this, they all would read the same time. There's a delay in getting the light to you that what the clock is reading. But if you were somehow had a clock that was synchronized and walked with it along from one coordinates crossing to the other, you, know, you would find that all the clocks out here read the same time. Now, when you get closer to this thing that is massive, the sun, two things have happened. First thing that's happened, and this is what that Einstein equation is trying to tell us. It's saying, look, you have curved space, the straight lines, those things that were the shortest distance between two points are no longer straight, no longer straight lines. They are curved lines. And the other thing is that, and this is not in the picture at all, that if you went with your clock and you would find out that all the clocks, as you get closer and closer to where the curvature is largest, they go more slowly. In other words, the clocks are affected by the gravitational potential, by the gravitational field, effectively, let's call it, or the curvature that's generated by the mass. And that same thing is true in a little bit by the Earth. And, and, uh, and, and a nice way of saying it, it's not my way of saying it, it's a beautiful way of saying it, uh, of, and this is from um, uh, a fellow at Princeton, is that the whole idea of general relativity, which is sort of being presented here, is that matter gets curved by space, by, by, by matter, um, space gets curved by matter, and then the matter moves the way the space tells it to. And it is, there, there are no longer forces. There are no more gravitational forces. And in this, in this setting, there are gravitational waves. And let me see if I can hear, what are those waves? Now, Einstein wrote two papers, one in 1916 and another one, and that, the, the, the theory I just told you about was in a paper in 1915. That was the beginning of general relativity. But then he wrote a paper in approximations to general relativity. How well could you see Newton in that? What, 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 when, when things aren't extremely strong, the fields aren't terribly curved, what, things, what does things look like? And he wrote one paper where he made a mistake, a typical Einstein mistake, a very interesting mistake. He assumed that uh, gravitational waves get generated by all kinds of sources, which turns out to be wrong. Turns out only special kinds of sources. They have to be non-spherically symmetric accelerated masses. So there is a little symmetry between gravitational waves as, as they are generated by accelerating objects, like in e and M, they are, they, are, they are generated by accelerating charges. But the problem is they can't be spherically symmetric. They, a, a uniformly expanding ball and contracting ball will not radiate gravitational waves. They would be spherical waves. They would be scalar waves. They don't. And uh, that tells you right away that this is going to be a tensor-like field. And that it turns out it is a quadrupolar field, but that is when you get to be very fancy. Now, the kinematics of these waves, and I'll show you what that looks like, and that's important to understand how they're detected. They propagate at the speed of light, or so Einstein suspected. And we will find in this talk that they really do propagate at the speed of light to an enormous precision. That's one of the experimental results now that we know. They're transverse waves. They're waves that very much like e m waves. Uh, they're waves that if they propagate in the x direction, they do their dirty work in the y and z direction. And, and now I want to show you what a gravitational wave looks like. So let me see if I can make this thing run. Yeah. What's been distributed here is a bunch of dots in space. I hope you can see this. And right where there's in the middle of it, there's a little square. That's you. You're at that square. And all these things around you, you'll notice two things about what those dots are doing. The dots, and let's say in one dimension, let's say up and down, are going opposite to what they're doing in the left and right. In other words, if there's compression in one dimension, it's expansion in the other, both of them perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating. You got that? That's very important. Now, the other property is that they are, what's constant in these waves 
at any one moment is the strain. That's the ratio of the displacement of the dots to their separation. So for example, that ratio grows. Take a look at the, the, this, here you are, that dot over there is moving a lot, as is the one that's the furthest away from you. But the, 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 if you divide the motion that they have by their separation, that turns out to be the same as the motion of the wire near you by their separation. So that is a constant delta L divided by L. And those two properties, the property that it is a transverse wave with these opposite motions in the two dimensions perpendicular to the propagation direction, and that it is a wave of constant strain at any one moment are all fundamental to being able to make the detection. You'll see that in a minute. So that's a picture you wanna have of what a gravitational wave looks like. I hope that, that, that you can now use that when we start looking at the apparatus. So here's the first guy, I have to drink a little bit of water, who thought of trying to detect gravitational waves directly. That's a guy named Joe Weber, who was an electrical engineer at the University of Maryland back in about the 60s. And, and I, I might as well say quite directly here that general relativity was never taught in a physics course until way, way late. I first encountered it, I had to teach one myself, which has a very important impact in this, in about 1966. That's the first time I ever had to teach GR and people be beginning to do it all over. But before that, it was always taught only in math departments because there was no physics there. There was nothing predicted that you could measure. And, and Einstein himself said this in one of, the, one of his papers about gravity waves, he says, they're so tiny that they'll never, they'll never show up in physics at all. That's what he wrote in 1916. And he, and he didn't change his mind by 1918. So what Joe did is something pretty, pretty daring. Joe was an electrical engineer and turning, turned into a physicist. And he decided he would try to look for this kind of motion that I showed you with the dots uh, by taking a great big aluminum bar, that thing on the right here. There is Joe, it's a bar bigger than him. And uh, he was looking for gravitational waves that would come and make the bar move, let's say this way in, in the horizontal direction expanding and in the radial direction this way contracting. And then he put strain gauges all over the thing. And he didn't put them in the right place, but that's all right. Uh, there were a lot of arguments later on, but this was his idea that maybe you should try to look for these things. And right behind him is a great big vacuum system and that vacuum system is holding one of the bars that he's made. Well, to his misfortune, and then by 19, by, by, well, he, by, by 1960, in the middle 60s, he was already giving talks all over the world saying that he was sniffing at gravitational waves. There was something exciting in these bars. And in 1969, he had the courage finally, or the stupidity, I don't know which, to say that he had actually now discovered gravitational waves. And thank God in physics you, and in all good science, what happens is people say, well, all right, that's fine. Now we should, this is an experiment. We can try that ourselves. And they did. And by 1972 already, nobody who had built a bar like this had ever seen anything like what Joe had seen. And that became quite a disgraceful situation. Joe would defend himself by saying, look, you didn't do it the way I did it. And that's not a defense against an experiment where people can prove they had the sensitivity. So things went from not so good to awful. And Joe became a pariah, which is unfortunate because he had a very brilliant idea here. So anyway, uh, let me show you the idea that ultimately did work. And this is the idea uh, that didn't work. And we now know, and I'll say it right here, it didn't have the sensitivity as we'll find out as we go on. But this now is a, a, the way a, a laser interferometer might do this. And what you have here is, and I'll, this is again an animation and I'll turn it on in a minute. Here's a laser. Of course, that isn't a real laser, that's a laser. Here's a beam splitter. We will divide the beam between passing through it and going to a mirror down there and coming back. 
to the splitter and part of the beam heading to a detector, which is this, this is the detector, or the, the beam of be being reflected from this beam splitter going to this mirror, coming back and uh, heading to the mirror. Now, what's the basic idea is that you make this path identical in length to that path until a gravitational wave comes along from above and makes this path a little longer and that one a little shorter. And you'll see this now in, in, in the, in, as, as we go forward. So here's a laser emitting its electric fields and the splitting going on. Wherever it's red, there is power, laser power. But the important thing is what the field is up to. And when the two paths are exactly equal, there is no radiation getting to the detector because it cancels. That's because of the way a beam splitter works. Now it comes along a gravitational wave which stretches one arm and shrinks the other. And now there is light going to the photodetector. When, and that is the basis of the detection. That's the whole story. It's a very simple-minded detector. The trouble comes in the numbers. Have I got any questions up to now? Really? Good. So that is, in fact, the device that made the detector. And, uh, but it had to be a lot fancier than you were, many of us thought. And the guy who told us that was Kip Thorne. That's Kip in an earlier epic of his life. And uh, he had, well, his group at Caltech was calculating how could, how big could H, which is delta L over L, the strength of the, the, of the field. That's the amplitude of the field. How big could that be from any kind of realistic sources that are out there? knowing that they're being accelerated and that they're accelerated by gravity and you know, following the rules of, of the Einstein equations. And the biggest he could think of is a strain of about 10 to the minus 21. And that made almost everybody very queasy about this whole thing. Joe Weber's detectors could not have done this. They could have done only about 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16, which is already pretty damn good. But now let's take and make the interferometer a length four kilometers long. And now you'll see the real impact of this statement. It says that delta L would have to be, if you, know, you want to measure a source that's that small or that large, uh, you would have to measure 10 to the minus 18 meters of motion. Well, that's a million times, no, that's a billion, 10 to 12 times bigger than the wavelength of light smaller than the wavelength of light. So that's already a challenge, but it turns out the real challenge, and we circ circumvented this challenge eventually, but the real challenge is that the, everything is moving. You're standing on the earth, everything vibrates, and the earth's surface is vibrating at, at all sorts of different frequencies, at least by 10 to the minus 12 uh, uh, meters. So that turns out to be one of the bigger challenges. Every noise term you can think of is bigger than the gravitational waves that you might be looking for. And that is the reason why it took from 1972 to about nine, to the 2015 for this thing to actually succeed. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ray, yeah, I saw Larry Wittig had a question. He had his hand up. Please. Rest yeah, of his, yeah uh, I, I was muted. Uh, the, your animation showed this beating going on at the detector. Do you, do you as actually, I, I thought from something I read that it's really just the leading edge that you're just looking at phase differences of the leading edge of the event? No, it turns out that there, there, there is actually the wave front that is generated by the source uh, has different frequency components. And they take different, uh, they, the phase shifts are actually measurable as, as phase shifts at the detector. In other words, you, you, what you do is you take the interferogram, you beat, what you do is you take the light from the uh, interferometer that's coming out of the interferometer from the two sides. And the, when you multiply them together on the, on the, in the, on the photo detector, uh, you, get, you get a beat frequency between the, the between this, the F and F plus delta F in the two signals. And it comes out as a, 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 as, a, as, a, as a signal that is a function of frequency versus time. 
which you can read very easily make into the actual motion of the source. So no, it's, it, 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 it is just exactly the motion of the source that you measure by measuring the phase uh, differences at, as a function of frequency at the detector. Did I, that, there is no tricky stuff done, okay? Now, there's some tricky stuff done when we wanna, and I'll show you that. Well, probably, I probably won't show you that, but generally what was done, and I'll, this is probably where you read something, is that at low frequencies where all these signals ultimately would be measured, because that's the ones where the gravitational wave sources are at frequencies like fractions of hertz up to maybe a kilohertz, something like that. That's what we now know. Uh, your laser is quite noisy. The amplitude noise and phase noise of the laser is quite noisy. So you have to frequency stabilize the laser. You have to amplitude stabilize the laser. And, and even then it's not good enough. So what you do is you actually take and propagate the signal up into the megahertz. So you're outside over the one over the one over F region of the laser noise. And that's probably where you read about edges because when you do that, you have multiplied your signal, not only by the frequency of one half of the signal against the other, but also by 10, probably 10 megahertz. And uh, you get a very, very narrow, 10 megahertz signal, which represents the entire signal you're looking for. You have to beat that down again by another 10 megahertz signal at laser frequency to recover the signal. I don't know, I think that's maybe what you read. Okay. I'll go on, okay. I was muted again. <laughs> what? I was muted again. <laughs> oh, you were muted again. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I'm, I, you that answered my question. I did or did not? You did. Okay, thank you. Thanks, I, I'm sorry. I, anyway, this is a picture of the noise as seen in the very first detector we built, the four kilometer detector. We had built many prototypes before, but I won't go into everything. I just wanna show you the nature of the different terms and how they vary as a function of frequency. Uh, and this is a H of, this is a spectral density of H, in other words, H per Hertz, per root Hertz. Some of you are engineers so that you, this is a matter of course for you, but when we talk about noise, you talk generally about a square of a, of a spectral density. Here, we're talking about the amplitude of the spectral density. So it's the amplitude at a given frequency by divided by the square root of the bandwidth. And then when you want to calculate the total noise, you have to integrate, put the thing back into power, integrate over frequency and take the square root again. I'm sorry about that, but this is a neat way to see the noise and what is important. So you can see the things that here's the region, this region that's the colored region as a function of frequency this is about a hundred Hertz. Here's about a kilohertz. And here is the region where that first detector operated well. And the thing that actually stopped it is quantum noise. We'll get to that. That's the noise in the quantum, just because the radiation field from the laser is quantized. And, uh, and that's shot noise and stuff. You can call it that, but it's really quantum noise. And then the radiation pressure noise, which doesn't happen to be a very big term here. It's, it's, not, big, it's not big enough, but it becomes big enough in the detector that ultimately made the detection. So call this quantum noise. That's a dominant noise that doesn't go away. And then there is a little bit right here that if you have mirrors and you have to, these mirrors are suspended by fibers. They have thermal noise in them. They're driven by thermal excitations. And so here's a little piece of the spectrum near hundred Hertz that's dominated by just plain old thermal noise, same as a KT noise in the resistor. And then here is the fact that you're standing on the earth and you're dealing with its seismicity. And that's true everywhere. For example, um, much of this stuff is anthropogenic but also much of it is just due to normal modes of the earth all being excited. Uh, it's just, this is one of the harder noises to get rid of. And you'll see that a lot of work had to be done past where we are here to be able to get this thing to move to the right, to the, to the left. So uh, other noises that are important are, you, you, you can't have much residual gas. For example, we didn't, we had to pump everything out. Why? Because of the scattering by the gas. So you, can, you have to do pretty good vacuum and you have to do better and better the smaller the signal. And then 
uh, here is a noise which will bother the field forever. And that's right here. And that is with mirrors, if you, even though you might be able to get rid of the seismic noise by now, I'll show you how that's done by making springs and masses. In other words, making Cadillacs rather than Model Ts, okay, for the suspensions. Uh, uh, here is a noise that you can't get rid of by making suspensions. And that is the fact that everything is shaking. It causes, for example, in the ground, a seismic wave that comes along near your mirror. If it's, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a compressive wave, it changes the density of the, of the ground. That changes the amount of mass pulling on your mirror, but through that Newton equation that I showed you in the first slide. And it turns out these gravity gradients look just like gravitational waves and they are a killer and they get worse and worse and worse as you go to lower and lower frequency. And you'll see that in a minute. And for the future, it turns out people are building gravitational detectors, wave detectors in space because of this term. This term dominates the noise as you get into low frequency and very interesting gravitational wave sources. So that's why I want to show you the picture. Okay, now we'll get right to the, 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 well, what, the what the apparatus looks like. Uh, there, were, there were in the United States, two detectors, one in, living, in, in, in Hanford, the same place where the bomb material, the plutonium was made during the Cold War and a little bit during the hot war. Uh, and then there is another one in Louisiana. Though the two de these detectors are run in coincidence, very much like what Joe Weber did with his bar, with his bar detectors. And then there are there's another detector which came on the air, unfortunately, after the initial detection. Uh, but that's in Italy near Pisa. There's a research detector that's in Germany. That group, by the way, did a lot of the initial technical development of these interferometers, the group at, Mon at the Max Planck Institute in Munich, and they moved to Hannover to make a bigger detector. And there is a detector operating in Japan now, uh, and that it's still trying to, it's still not sensitive enough, and a, the detector is being planned in India. It's being, it's funded, but it's just slow going. So why do you need so many detectors? Well, it turns out when you detect a source, you're measuring these gravitational wave excitations of the mass of your mirrors through the interferometer, but you're not seeing anything. And the only way you can tell where that source might be to relate it to the rest of astronomy is by actually having many detectors and seeing when a pulse or a signal comes to Livingston, what delay in time is there to get to Hanford or to get to... Uh, to Virgo. You, you can only measure the position in the sky by measuring delay times of the signals themselves relative to the, to the detectors. And that's very, very important to be able to understand what you are looking at. You know, so that'll come home in a minute. So here's what one of these detectors looks like. This is the one in Louisiana. And uh, this is a little travel log, it won't take long. I hope I just will show you. This is Louisiana. This is, this is Hanford. These are these beam tubes that are covered by concrete. This is the way the same thing looks in Louisiana. Here's what the beam tubes are highly evacuated and they carry uh, many, many laser beams. And here's a laser table, just like you might have in a, a ordinary lab. And here's the control room in Livingston and people learning how to control the actual interferometer. So that's, it's, it's big science. It's in total number of what you just saw there. All that stuff cost about $200 million. And it costs about $50 million a year to run it. That's those two detectors together. Now, that first detector that I showed you the noise curves of didn't make a detection. That when we started looking in 2001. And here is a spectrum. These are all different spectra as a function of time. You can see this, the dates and the colors, and this in, in amplitude of motion. And finally, you get down to here about where you're measuring 10 to the minus 19 meters here per root hertz. 
<clears throat> 10 to the minus 18 meters per root hertz. And this is sort of the very last detector we built in, the, in those same facilities. We kept improving and improving and improving. And we finally got down to here with all the improvements, laser power, better suspensions, better everythings. And you can see that we made it to what almost made it to the design. And the design is that dash curve right here. And that's the theoretical curve, knowing all the noises that we have. What are the and, spikes? Uh, those spikes, yeah, well, there are lots of spikes from different things. Every, many of those spikes are, no, uh, are for example, when you the, the wires are the, the mirrors are suspended by wires and they have violin modes. They start, oh, up around, uh, let's see. Yeah, the first violin modes are 500 Hertz. So they're around here. And then they are multiples of them. But these are resonances in the masses and resonances in certain suspensions elements and some are the calibration lines. Most of the black ones are calibration lines. Okay, so uh, now, why I'm showing you this is that that red curve is the best we ever got. And I'm very proud of the fact that it was a clean non-detection. We didn't screw around. We saw nothing at that level and we're damn sure of it. So we were able to go back to our sponsor, the National Science Foundation. And this was already part of the plan, but now we were able to say, look, we've done as well as we can with what we have. We need to make some improvements down in here because more likely we'll detect something in this region. And we were given the money. <coughs> That's included in the 200 million that I was telling you about. And here are the things that were done. Here, for example, you get an idea of what a suspension looks like. This is a, here's that very precious mirror that's reflecting that light. It's a piece of fused silica, but it's hung by very few thin fused silica fibers that have very low thermal noise. And they sing a little bit, and those are those, no, those uh, violin resonances. They're supported from another big mass. And then there are four separate pendula, each one isolating the next one by one over omega squared about, by one over the frequency squared. So this thing is isolate, being isolated above sort of eight Hertz by one over F to the eighth, right? So this is a, one of the big things that was put in after 2006. And then we built a thing which might be useful to some of you guys. We built a thing called the active vibration isolation system. You can see this suspension hanging from it. This is the active system right up here. And that's all in vacuum. And here is a suspension, this uh, very low noise, thermal noise suspension. And, but this is two stages of a seismometer. Okay, so you can see the seismometers. Let me get rid of, you know, I can, well, I can't do much. Uh, is that black band in your picture? Well, okay, it probably isn't. So anyway, these are two. Not here. Yeah, these are, each one of these stages has three seismometers on it. And what you do is you take, uh, here's, take this one, for example, you have pushers, coil pushers that make it so that you get a null in the seismometer. In other words, it's a fee, uh, active feedback system to the outer mass. There's two of them, one on the inner mass, one, one on the inside, and then again, one on the outer side to which you hang this very delicate thing. And each of these has a active system that suppresses the ground noise by actually pushing on the, 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 the box so that the seismometer is nulled. And that's a trick, just like what you do when you have headphones that try to kill the noise in an airplane and you're trying to listen to music. You know, you amplify the, the noise and invert it. That's what you're doing here. And so this is a trick that Actually, I think if you want to make a very good vibration isolation system that really wor works in a place like a city, you will be forced into a thing like this too. And people in the semiconductor industry now are starting to build things like this because they can get higher densities. So uh, higher densities of chips, uh, of, of the gates on the chips. So here is then the noise. It looks right, a little different. This is the noise of the second detector called the advanced detector. And the, and the advanced detector is 
you can see the gravity gradient noise, which is the, the killer, gravity gradients is this green thing. That's still there, you can't do anything about it. But the quantum noise has been reduced a lot. And the thing that remains a very, very important noise, which was not an important noise at all, is the thermal noise of the coating, that red thing, the coating itself on the mirror, that coating that's sitting on the mirror. And by the way, that has had an important effect on those of you who care about making good atomic clocks. Atomic clocks now have been using lasers as a driver, and they have had this problem also, that the frequency of the atomic clock is, 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 a, is affected by the noise of the coating on the mirrors. And we, if we solve this problem, that will solve the atomic clock problem as well. So anyway, that's the, the detector. And here is what we saw almost the day that we started running it. Uh, this is the Livingston detector, and this is the Hanford detector. These, this is the Louisiana one, and that's the Pacific Northwest one. This is garbage. This is time. This is strain. And uh, you can see that there is something coming up. And this is real, and this is crap again. So there's crap out here and crap in here. And this is the same problem at, at Hanford. This is junk, but there is this coherent thing. You can put the two together and you get something which is equivalently good at the two sites, given the noise. And that is our initial signal. That's what we saw. You can rewrite it in terms of frequency. And here is the frequency component, spectral component. And here is that same thing in, in the time again. This is a time series, but this is this amplitude so you can see. And now the color and the brightness tells you where the bulk of the energy is. And most of the energy here is at about 150 hertz, something like that, at both, this is both sites. So we considered this a signal that was really worth looking at. And Rainer, that's what... uh, Tony, Tony has his hand up if he yeah. wants to ask a question now, Tony. Please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, in the slide that you showed the active vibration isolation, I had a question. Sure, let's go back, if I can. Yeah. yeah, great. Uh, it appears that the quad suspension is connected to a block that is light gray. Is that uh, correct? Is attached, I mean. The quad is connected to the, this. The, yeah, let me point. The quad is, I said it wrong in my talk. It's connected to the inner system. Because I can see how yeah. the accelerometer you have in that half egg shape yeah. can help you. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. By the vibration in three dimensions. I said, I, you're absolutely right. I said it wrong. The inner one is a doubly isolated one. And the outer one is the first isolated, first isolated one. You can see that by, by this connection right here. Yes, I can see that. But I think those black strings that connect quad suspension to that outer shell should be connecting it to the cross hatched shell. Um. Oh dear. Because if you're nullifying the, the motion of the cross hatched element. Uh, no, I don't think so. I'll tell you why. The outer one, this is, this is a, they're, they're the size, these are the seismometers, V and H, and they're connected to that. See, and the. Okay, there, there is something funny yeah. about this picture. Yeah, you're right, you're right. There is something funny about it. I don't yeah. want to slow you down. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I see what you're saying. This is one of the, this is a other seismometer, but yeah. Yeah, if it is that other seismometer that is floating and is used to nullify the motions, then the black lines should be connected to the cross hatch. To, to cross hatch pieces, yes. I agree with you. I okay. think that, that, okay, you're absolutely right. I think that picture has an error. You're quite right. But it's the, it's the inner one that is first and then the outer one. No, the, inner, the outer one first and then the inner one. But the inner one is wrong. But I didn't draw that picture. I should have looked at it more carefully. <laughs> not that I would have made, not made that mistake. I would have made it too. Okay, you're right. But, look, but you can imagine the thing. The idea is pretty straightforward, right? I hope you got that. Yes, correct. I, yeah. I understand that field. That's why... Yeah. Kind of, that looks strange to me a little bit. Yeah, Thank okay. You. Thank you. Sure. sure. Rainer, so just it. another question on the same picture, if you don't mind. Yeah, go. I'm just naively because I don't understand all of this stuff thoroughly. So just bear with me. No, no, by all means. 
I screwed yeah. up on that picture, so that's the first. No, thing no, no. I'm, Tony's <laughs> Tony's question is far more technical than mine. Be sure. Uh, the seismometers you have there, they they measure things, and there is in fact a time delay between the measurement and the response to response to the change. Absolutely. So you have a lot you have a lot of time delays in this, and how does that get accounted for in the appropriate manner? Well, you do that with all servo systems. You have filters that, uh, and you adjust the gain curve so that you don't, uh, you don't get instability. So that's what, that, that delay, by the way, the delay, there are two things that limit this system. It's not so much turns out to be the delay. It turns out that the biggest problem in this active system is that the seismometers, these are store-bought seismometers, uh, are, have magnetic readouts, and some of them have electro, electrostatic readouts, and they are much noisier than the laser readout. And so systematically now, to improve these vibration, active vibration isolation systems, we are installing laser interferometers in the seismometers. Now, nobody in the geophysics business cares about that because these are already very, very good. They're the best seismometers you can buy. But uh, that's one problem. The other problem is the delays are not anywhere near as bad a problem as the fact that they have normal modes where a, a tilt is misinterpreted as a horizontal motion, for example. You can, can you imagine that? I mean, that's not, it's, it's quite natural in a, in a pendulum, that's what happens. And uh, so you have to be very careful how you tailor the, the spectral response and the, the, the feedback response to the table. So that's an art and we, it takes, took us a long time to get that right. But the, type, the, the kind of isolation you get, I'll, get, I'll give you a good number. At about a hertz, the isolation is about 100, okay? That's, you don't get that kind of thing with springs and masses easily, okay? And uh, by the time you get to a tenth of a hertz, it's only about 10. So, and that's partly because of the noise in the instruments themselves. You, they, will be, they will drive... The, 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 the seismometers noise will drive those, those boxes. And we're, the next version, which we, we're in the middle of trying to design right now, will use, well, we will get factors, about a factor of 100 over both, over both of the numbers I just gave you. Good, can thank I, you. Yeah. Can I just ask really quick, sure. back on the same diagram. I'm curious, uh, how, what are the actuators such that they don't, introduce more noise than yeah no no that's no that's a key question uh, it, it, the actuators in this case are magnet uh, are, are magnet a magnet and coils makes sense thank you yeah i mean uh, you could, we don't you electrostatic actuators we tried in an earlier version when i built at mit it was all electrostatic because i didn't trust the barkhausen noise in magnets and uh, it turns out there is barkhausen noise in all of the driving circuits for everything we have, the whole interferometer, by the way, I didn't tell you all of this, but you seem to be interested in this, is driven as a servo system. In other words, you, the, all the mirrors that you see, for example, all those in the original, initial picture, uh, everything that is in the interferometer is held in position by a servo system. And in many cases, those are electrostatic now. And so what happens is the way you read out the system, and this is a thing that is I think absolutely critical for this particular kind of instrument to work. The way you read out the system is you don't let anything move. Every degree of freedom that you can get is closed in a, into a closed servo system with a, with a filter and amplifiers that are no, no, noise free enough so they don't contribute to the noise. And in other words, that's part of the whole design. You have to make extremely quiet amplifiers. In, the, in these servo systems. But now what happens, how do you measure the signal? You measure the signal by looking at the error signals that are effectively the forces that you are applying to the mirrors to hold them in a fixed place. That's the way we get the signals. So, and in the process, we damp everything. All the normal modes of everything is damped by these servo systems. So you couldn't do it, you couldn't build a thing with 10,000 servos like what we have without have, I mean, 10,000 mirrors. It's about that many mirrors for angle, for, for position, for all sorts of, it's just a huge 
co collection of optical systems, they cannot move on their own. They have to be held in a fixed position. And that fixed position has to be a, a, a position that you can always come back to by using different kinds of, um, uh, you know, trans, uh, servo, servo trans, when you have, um, well, we have, you use lock-in systems everywhere where you, you have small oscillations that you drive the system with. Those oscillations then have to be at a point where you get not omega, but two omega response. There's a whole bunch of tricks you're pulling. I didn't even mention those. So the, the, the thing is a gigantic servo system. And this is just another little piece of a servo system. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. I didn't tell you that in the beginning because it, 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 most people won't believe you, but never mind. Um, should I go on? Should I go on? Please. Yep. Okay, so let me see how I get back. Um, oh, yeah. Now I want to show you a little physics. That is the noise that that makes, if you hear it. And now it's, we change its frequency, or this is cheating. That's multiplying the frequency by three. And that is a chirp. That's a chirp that is generated by this source. And here is what I, we I think that- I didn't hear anything. Oh, you didn't hear anything? Okay, it, did, it didn't make it to you. Okay, let's not worry about it. Here is, um, here is what this, and this is now another triumph of this field. And that is, um, I see, I'm not going to, you guys good for another half, well, maybe 20 minutes. We have till 1130. Nope. So what, it's your okay, time. okay. 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 Well, this fact, people, people will generally stay longer. They, okay. They don't move when there's something interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, this, this is the other miracle the, besides the technical miracles that were pulled off over those many, many years, this is numerical relativity. And it turns out that you couldn't solve the problem analytically, and it's been very, very hard to solve those Einstein equations analytically. And this business of being able to make numerical solutions of these highly nonlinear equations came along just about the same time as the detector sensitivity got to the point where you could measure these things. So this is a, this is a numerical solution. This is not a drawing or painting. This is a computer output of two black holes going around each other, which is what we think this source is. And you can see the same kind of, uh, you know, see those, those the color coding is the time that's being kept here. The time is in colors where it's red, it's slowed down. And where it's black, time has stopped entirely. You'll see something like that in a minute. And the arrows indicate where the stress is in the field or the, or the, the, the uh, strains in the field are large. And this then is the, geometry of space and time and with time on the left top left it's now being slowed down uh, of what they is we think this source is these are two black holes and they are just about to form into a single black hole and then everything kind of calms down the gravitational waves leave and what's left now is a thing that is about well i'll tell you in a minute but about three solar masses has gone off in, in gravitational waves and each and each mass was around uh, 15 or 20 solar masses. I, I, I'm not sure those are the last two numbers, but you'll see them in a, in a table. So anyway, that is what the numerical relativity gives that matches the waveform that I that we saw experimentally. Uh, and here here is a sort of thing that this is the result well, I mean, uh, yeah yeah here is a, a diagram of what we're just talking about. That was on the 14th of September in 2015. And uh, this strain was about 10 to minus 21 at the top of that. And, you know, okay, so I'm sorry, the masses were three solar masses went off in gravitational waves, but each of the two masses before they were together were about 30. And there's a very interesting thing that I want to tell you about. If that whole effect, if that whole thing, by the way, this took place at about uh, 1.5 billion years away from us. That's where this happened. And, uh, but if it took place at one AU, suppose this was at the position of the sun, the strain that you would experience is tiny. 
It's only 10 to the minus six. In other words, you wouldn't even feel this. You might hear it in your ear. Or, but the amount of energy that was going through you is about 10 to the 25 watts per meter squared. In other words, the sun puts out about a kilowatt per meter squared. This is 10 to the 22 times more power than the sun is putting out as light power. So it tells you something very, very important, which is what Einstein said. This is a tiny, tiny little effect, but it uses tremendous amounts of energy to distort space. And that is sort of the characteristic of all gravitational waves. Everyone we saw is that way. They are tiny effects that cause, and you need a tremendous amount of energy to, to, to distort space. And about the Young's modulus at, of, of space at, let's say, 100 hertz is about 10 to the 20 times that of steel. So space is just very hard to distort. And then here are further sources. This one we were never sure of. We, we can see when that happened let's say in October of that year. Here's one we were sure of. A very, uh, two black holes, different mass. One mass went off as, uh, uh, as uh, gravitational waves and, uh, and, this, and two small, smaller masses. And here's another one. So we began to see a lot of these things. And uh, here is a very important new event that happened because now, this is somewhat times later, this is now two years later. Here is Virgo, that other detector that's in Italy it finally is beginning to measure something and it's just about measured this particular black hole. And it does help. For example, here is sort of the uncertainty circle on the sky of where this black hole might, this particular black hole might be. It's not, not important, but this, if you plot a, a circle, you know, this, this is the whole sky and this is a banana on the sky that you get if LIGO is only LIGO. If you add to that the, uh, uncertain the, the fact that Virgo also saw this, you can get a thing that's much smaller. The error circle is much smaller. And that is the idea that I was telling you about before on localization of the sources. Okay. Now here is sort of this catalog of the black holes. There's about a hundred we've seen that are paired black holes. Here are black holes that have been seen by electromagnetic, uh, no, they're not, not then some black holes were seen by electromagnetic um, measurements from x-rays, but this is neutron stars, a lot of neutron stars. We'll get to that in a second. So now there's a whole field where the field has grown. We now have, uh, we're not running right now, we're improving, but typically we see now a black hole. We will be seeing a black hole every couple of days. Now here's a, something that's completely different. And this, was seen in uh, also in, 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 in 2017. But here, the time is much longer. You can see this is the time. And this is the this, this strain measured in frequency. And that's one of these strain versus frequency curves, but it goes for a long, long time. A very different kind of object. Since you can't hear this, I'm not gonna play it for you. But the important thing is, it's a different shape entirely. This is, the, this is the gravitational wave signal in frequency. And it was also seen by a gamma ray telescope that's out there within about two seconds after the gravitational wave was over. At the end of that chirp, there was a pulse seen in a gamma ray telescope and at, at one energy between 10 to 50 keV. And then another one, there are two telescopes on the same satellite of different energies. There's, there's, and then there's a second different complete satellite, which also saw this, not as well. And this was a big deal because now an electromagnetic telescope had also seen, that means a, a thing that looks at electromagnetic fields also saw the gravitational wave. And with that, and the fact that we had Virgo going, you could now, here's the whole sky, you could do something which we now made a huge difference. If you take the uncertainty in the position of the LIGO detector, which is this, and add the uncertainty from the Virgo detector, which by the way, it's a little subtle. Virgo did not see the source, but the reason we can use it is because we know it how it's sensitive enough to have seen the source had it been in a place where the detector does not have a null. This kind of these detectors have a null in a certain place. 
and they, they don't detect it at a certain angle, 45 degree cones. And that happened to be in the 45 degree cone, unfortunately. But we could, if we say it was in the 45 degree cone, it would be a smaller error. And then that was given to astronomers. And they saw a galaxy uh, two weeks before. Here's a galaxy. And there are these stars that are in our own galaxy. But there's that galaxy. And here's that galaxy about 10 hours after they got the signal from us. And there is a new thing right there. That new thing is what the whole, all about 3,000 different astronomers were able to nail that thing. And they drew a tremendous amount of inferences, which added to the value of what this source really is. And this, we, the source is really a pair of neutron stars, two neutron stars, stars that are equal to the mass of the sun, but about the density of nuclear matter. So a spoonful of that stuff weighs about 10 to the 15 grams. It's, it's huge. You can't, you can't pick the spoon up. Uh, but now those are stars which are the end result of supernova. They may even be some stars that are formed just that way, made only of nuclear material. And they collided, made this gravitational wave that's that chirp, and then they turned into a black hole. And we saw all of this. People saw the black hole being formed by the kind of uh, pulses that were coming out of from radio telescopes. They saw a, a glowing ember that's this thing called a, a, a pillow nova and watch the whole thing sort of decay. And here are some of the inferences that they were able to draw from this. For example, many of you will recognize this as a periodic table. And one of the things that people had always guessed at is what were the origin of the elements? How did the elements get generated? Well, we know that hydrogen and helium got generated in the early explosion of the universe. But where did, and a little bit of lithium is also comes from that tiny, little tiny bit, that color coding. But most of the other metal, most of the other things come from stars being cooked, nuclear physics being done in stars. And that's what the yellow and the gray. And uh, so it turns out people were having trouble getting past iron. Here, for example, we now know that most and probably all of the heavy metals like, well, in this case, gold and platinum and iridium and osmium and all, all of these are made only in merging neutron stars. In other words, here, these, these things have enormously rich neutron surroundings. But now, and now we know because people watched the light curves of these neutron stars after the gravitational wave was, had made, made the discovery, uh, they were able to, to find out by looking at the light curve and matching it to what was known that they were making mostly heavy elements. So that was a wonderful discovery. Had, it had ben, been guessed. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mike Alexander has a question. Sure. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. Okay. Um, when, when you showed the um, gravitational wave and then the, the gamma ray detection. Yeah, I'll go back, hold on. There was a well, there was a delay. Yeah. Gam why, if it's from the same source, why should okay. the gamma ray be delayed compared to the gravitational wave? Okay, why? Well, I'll tell you what. That delay is only 1.7 seconds. That source is 1 140 million light, year, light years away. Okay? So these two waves, the gravitational wave and the gamma ray, have been traveling together for 140 million years. And there's only a 1.7 second difference between their arrival. Why, what could cause that? Well, most likely it is done at the source. The gravitational wave comes first, has to form, the hot thing has to form, the plasma that makes the gamma rays has to form. Most people think that's what that delay is, okay? But to, it's already enough and this is something I'm glad that you brought it up because I missed it. I didn't, I, this tells you already that the two waves are traveling at some part of a part in 10 to the 15 of the velocity of light. In other words, gravitational waves travel at the velocity of light to a part in 10 to the 15 
of, of delta C over C. Otherwise, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be that close together after 140 million years. Forget about the 1.7 second delay. Okay. You understand? Yeah. Okay. But I, I agree with you there. There's a delay, but I think people have been able to explain that delay as the mechanics of getting the plasma together after the uh, two, two black holes, after the two neutron stars have collided. And we will talk more about that in a second. Rainer, there was one question in the chat and uh, John Rudy was asking, does it require something? I missed it. Does, what does it require well, something? I'm sorry. Uh, does it require something as strong as two black holes colliding, merging to generate a measurable wave? Well, yes. I mean, that's the trouble. That, that's exactly it. it, it it's, it's, a, it's such a goddamn weak uh, field. The, the strain is so small. Yes. We can, a neutron star will do it. And now we have looked at other sources. And Kip Thorne, when he made his number, that 10 to the minus 21 number, was thinking of black holes. He was the only person in the country, really, at that time, thinking that black holes really existed. At well, MIT. Let me expand my question just, just a little bit. So you've now shown in one of your previous charts that you've picked these up at an incredibly frequent rate, like every couple of days. Well, no, it, it not, it's going to be every couple of days once we get the new, the, the, it, it was about once every week or something like that. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. So I yes. guess there's a real message there in, in how yes. frequently events of this magnitude uh, have arisen, recognizing that what we're seeing now happened a billion years ago or whatever. Well, you're absolutely on the mark. It's happening maybe a lot more frequently in the early days of the universe than in, the, in our time now. That's not been proved. And I'll show you at the very end, which is coming, uh, what our best guesses are. But you're absolutely right. It's a much more common event than the neutron stars. And the reason why it's so much more common is because the neutron, neutron stars are a lot lighter and we don't see as many of them because of the antenna noise or the detector noise masking them. I, I think we, we, you know, in order to get a good statistic, we need to look at more. And we, uh, the, but the fact that we see, see, see so many black holes, we've only seen one or two, we've now seen three neutron star mergers, but only one spectacular one, that it was as close as 140 million light years away. Most of what we're seeing is all a billion years away, which is what you would expect because the number of sources goes as the volume of the universe. And the volume keeps growing as you make the radius bigger and bigger. So, so it, it's, not, it's, not very mis, it's, not mis, it's not very mysterious that you, 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 once you get past a certain distance, and for example, with a detector that's what, 10 times better, which is what we're planning, we will see a, a black hole event every, every half hour, maybe every 15 minutes. But there's going to be a limit. And one of the most important questions now is where do the black holes come from? Are they all from dead stars or are, were there black holes already in the primeval, primeval universe? Meaning that there were black holes formed before stars were formed. Now that could happen because they are creatures of the geometry of general relativity and they don't require uh, a star to make them. Uh, a, 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 any kind of real large curvature will make a black hole. You know, a very strong gravitational field, which doesn't mean you have to have matter. You can, you could have just large curvatures in the, in the gravitational field. And those are things that the early universe could have made just by, the, by its huge accelerations. And those are the, the exciting questions that are now all in front of us. Namely, what really is out there? And uh, we expect that it's going to be spectacular, interesting stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me go back to another couple of things, and so I, I, I will be able to finish uh, here. We have we have well, plenty of time, so don't you don't. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's just that I don't want to keep people. Here is a thing which is a more for the aficionados. I mean, I don't know. Some of you probably know that there is an a not a raging controversy, but a beginning controversy between what's called the Hubble constant measured by measuring accelerations. What, what, what is the Hubble, Hubble constant? The Hubble constant is a cosmological parameter that is the ratio 
of the velocity of an object with respect to another object, let's say, call it the Earth, make it simple, call it the Earth, the velocity of that object out there uh, relative to the Earth versus divided by the distance it's away from the Earth. That, when you have an, a cosmic explosion, it turns out that the further something is away from us, the faster it's moving away from us. That was discovered in the 20s by Hubble. And that relationship between the, the velocity and the, the, yeah, the velocity and the distance is, has had huge variations in it. And it's not because it's hard to measure the velocity. The velocity is easy to measure. You measure the velocity by measuring the, the, the Doppler shift of spectral lines that you know, like hydrogen or other things you might know. And you look and compare them with the same line that you have on the Earth. And they will be redshifted. In other words, they will be at a much lower frequency, longer wavelength. The hard, the hard part of this thing is getting the distance. And this, that's the denominator of that ratio. And that has been guessed at and has varied by factors of hundreds from the, from the time of 1928 to now. So, and the way that's done in, in this picture, there are two ways it's done. The blue line, what, this is a picture of the Hubble constant in these crazy units, kilometers per second divided by megaparsecs. That kilometer per second is a velocity and megaparsecs is a, is a distance, it's a cosmological distance. And it comes out in those units that there is one group of measurements, which is the, if you see this picture, the, the greenish one, well, about 68, which is already now for the first time different, that's a cosmological way of measuring that constant, that different than the one measured by the standard method of looking at supernova. This is the way, the way this is done is you look at supernova, which is a star exploding. You find those supernova, which you think are all the same. And you use the light output of the supernova as a measure of the distance, just like the candle power. In other words, you measure the one over, you measure the one over R squared distance by measuring the amount of light that hits a photomultiplier. And that is a, it's a, it's a terribly hard measurement to make because it's affected by the dust that's between you and that source. It may not be the right supernova. There's a whole bunch of, but people are now become fairly confident and they are actually saying those error bars, which are in that picture for those two numbers are real. Well, if that's true, there's a discrepancy by those measurements of the Hubble constant as measured by, this, by, by astronomy, near-term astro near astronomy, and those that are measured by cosmology. Using cosmology, there's a wonderful way to measure it. And you can measure that from the oscillations, the acoustic oscillations of the, of the plasma that makes up the early universe. You can get the Hubble constant out of that. I won't go any further into that, but that's all from something called the three degree background radiation, which is an enormously wonderful discovery that was made in 1965, that, that there is a cosmic background and you ought to have somebody tell you about that. I'll gladly tell you about that in another lecture if you want. I worked on that as well. Uh, but the cosmic background is one of the most interesting things that we have discovered as man in the history of man. And uh, it says the universe is a black body up until you start making stars and galaxies. Then it no longer is. And so, uh, but if you look at that primeval universe, you can get a different way of measuring a Hubble constant and you get, it, it is different. Why? And now what that curve is that's, that's in there is a curve that you can get from that one neutron star that we have, because what, what, what can we do that other people can't do? Well, we can measure the strain in our instrument that comes from two stars, like those two neutron stars. Now, what, here, here's how that works. We, may, we, can measure the, we, we, we can measure the waveform, that's the frequency versus time of the actual dynamics of the two neutron stars. That makes the chirp. The chirp tells you the masses of the neutron stars. That mass then, you can put at a distance because we know how the mass is, the Einstein equation, the Einstein field equations tell you how far it is. 
So we know the distance by using the waveform we get from the neutron stars and Einstein's field equations. That's how we get the distance. And we can also get, uh, and that's the important one, and we can get the redshift, or the, we can get the, 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 uh, the, the, the velocity of that whole system by looking at what galaxy <laughs> is this particular black hole, a, a particular neutron star pair associated with. We know that by the, the discovery that was made by all the astronomers. So we have another way of getting the, the velocity of the object with respect to the Earth and the distance to the object. And that curve, which is drawn in there, is the best fit we get for the, the Hubble constant. I mean, the highest probability is right between the two. I don't know if I believe that, but what it shows, however, that if we get more and more of these, especially if we make a more sensitive antenna, so we have hundreds of these per year, not just one or two per year, we can probably do damn well in getting the Hubble constant out of gravitational waves. And that's a future direction in which people are trying to, and that was first, these two gentlemen, uh, Bernie Schutz, if you know him, is the guy who came up with that idea. So that's another thing that came out of that. And finally, there are two more things that have not been measured. One is that you can measure something which is a nuclear force between these two neutron stars, something which people are not measured in high energy experiments. Uh, they tried at Brookhaven to do this, but what you see, this is a picture now of these two neutron stars as they get very, very close. And they start pulling a tide in each other. You know, they're no longer round. Why? Because, well, one, the force now on one is pulling a tide in the other. That causes the chirp to change. And that's what this dotted line down below here is. That change, compared to no, when there is no change, when there is no uh, uh, tidal term, gives you the, a, what's the deformation of what we call quark gluon matter. So something very, people are doing high energy physics with nuclei would love to have. They would love to know how stiff is a nucleus. And that's something we can tell them once we actually get another one of these and we don't have enough signal noise to see that right now. And then finally, so are you saying that the nuclear force, I mean, so there is no gravitational force. There's only the distortion of space time. Yep. But now on top of that, you're putting a nuclear force because that's right. That's a completely different field. Yep. Ooh. Well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. The thing that's distorting the neutron star is not the nuclear force. It's the gravitational. It's, it's, it, it is the curvature of space time that's doing that. Uh. But, okay. but the nuclear force should be acting. Yes, it is. And it's keeping the thing from falling apart. You see, it's, it, the nuclear force is acting and it's holding the thing together a little bit, but it's also being held together by gravity. It's, right. a, compli it's a complicated, right, right. It's a complicated right, right. thing. Okay. So you want to separate these two things and yeah. tell me what the nuclear force is. That's right. Yeah. And you can do that if you have enough cycles of motion. All right. That's, so this that's, is the that's, that's cool. Yeah. And here's the next one. This is another, it's another thing that has not been seen. And that is you take that gluon, once that plasma forms, once the, you get the two nu the, 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 the neutron stars now are completely disintegrated and they have become a quark gluon plasma. That, that gluon quark, quark plasma has normal mode oscillations of its own. And those are these frequencies that are up here. The, these are oscillations of that, and these are different models, different equations of state of the nuclear matter. And here are possible detections of these different, that you, we can get what's called the equation of state of this particular quark gluon matter. That's a way of getting at the same thing as with the tidal term. It's just another way of doing it. But this time the star has no long, is no longer uh, is, 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 is the gravitational force is no longer important. It's all the quark gluon. Okay, the, the thing is separated out. It's grown to the point where the thing that's really holding it together now is the quark gluon. So we have a nice way to do some pieces of nuclear physics. And so let me take you to the, the last two slides. 
Well, this is actually the, yeah, this is the last slide. And this is sort of the future. Uh, what, what you see here is not, this is frequency at the bottom. And on the right is ground-based detectors. And on here on the left here, this thing is the strain that you're sort of a typical strain, H, that you can measure with these things. And so here is LIGO and all sorts of uh, European third generation detectors. And we hope to be able to do better by about a factor of 10 than what is in this picture. That's with something called Cosmic Explorer. And that is making LIGO 40 kilometers long, not four kilometers long. And you're exploiting now the fact that the gravitational wave strain is constant. And so as you make the system longer, the thing that's noisy, which is this, the displacement, gets bigger by a factor of 10 if you make it 10 times longer. It's as simple as that. And it costs money. And it's going to be a struggle to get it. But when you look at the science, and I didn't do that. I, yeah, that's what's missing. Ah, that slide is the one that's missing. Hold on. This is the, the last slide. I'll show that other one. This is what it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here are, I'm sorry. Uh, that, that, this is the picture I want to show. But now you're sort of familiar with this. Here's strain. This is now the sensitivity in, in, in strain versus frequency. And here is where LIGO made its discovery. This is the, where we, have, we will be. This line right there is where we hope to be at, uh, with the, the, the one we're now fixing up. Here is a possibility for a further change in LIGO. But if you really want to go the next factor of 10, from here, you've got to build a new thing. And that is Cosmic Explorer, which is this 40 kilometer LIGO, or something in Europe, and they're very busy trying to get money for that in Europe, called the Einstein Telescope. It's again, it's a, it's a this is going to be a uh, 15, you know, I think it's a 10 kilometer triangle buried underground. And they hope to get around the, gra the Newtonian gravity gradient somewhat by doing that. We just are going to make it longer and get around the gravity gradients. Anyway, but these two things are the ideas that are the third generation detectors. And you can see for certain things, they're about the same. Uh, the, the Einstein's a little better than Cosmic Explorer for certain classes of sources. But this is the picture I really want to show you. Over here, what you have is something where as you go out in distance, this is redshift, which is the same as distance. What's plotted in here is the distribution of neutron stars we believe that are out there. So these yellow guys are, the dis as in distance, are the positions of the neutron stars. And the white guys are the positions of the black holes. And then buried in here are the pictures for these various detectors. And you can see, uh, with gravity wave, the, yeah, the, what we're hoping to have with the new LIGO detector that's just being built will be somewhere with reach of this dotted line. In other words, we're gonna get a lot more sources. Initially, we were at a distance of about here. So we saw, and then we got more and more, and then we got out to about 100, and this will be a lot more yet. But if we wanna, if you build LIGO, the Cosmic Explorer, you're going to be way, way out here. In other words, you're going to be past virtually all of them if our model is right. So that's one of the reasons we want to build Cosmic Explorer and ET, the Einstein telescope. You will be outside of all the black holes if they happen to be generated in stars. Because in here, there are not yet enough stars in this region, this distance away from us. That's what the James Webb telescope is going to be looking at, hopefully, in here. And here is the same situation with neutron stars. And this is why people are so optimistic. If we can build ET and CE, you're going to have so many neutron stars that you can do the Hubble constant and all sorts of wonderful cosmological measurements. You can measure, for example, maybe gravitational radiation from the initial universe directly. In other words, that's a whole other story. Name it, that there might be 
a whole background of gravitational waves that come from the very moment the universe got generated. And that, to me, is one of the most exciting things that you can possibly go for. So anyway, there's a lot of wonderful things to look for. Not only the, the whole population of neutron stars and black holes, but all sorts of cosmological things that could be there. They, they may, may not be, but they could be there. And you could not get until you get out uh, to distances of the order of 100, uh, the redshift of 100, or a Z, those of you who know about astronomy, a Z of about 100. So that is the future for ground-based, uh, the ground-based detectors. Now, now, now let me take you to that final slide. Sorry to Rainer, be- Mike, Mike, yeah. uh, Mike Alexander had a question, if you don't sure, mind. Sure, please. Yeah, please. Now I can, I can save the question until the end. Okay, well. well all right, I'll do it now. And okay, is, I, I'll try to make- the, You were talking about, you, you mentioned um, sources of gravitational wave that would that would be different from from uh, colliding stars, things of that sort. Right. And the question is, um, since it's known that there's a great deal of dark matter. Right. Could there? Could... Well, that's a good question. Is dark could... matter a source of gravitational waves? People don't think so. Right. They they, they think it is. It, if it, there's a lot of ifs. It turns out if dark matter happens to be matter that collects with itself around black holes and somehow is correlated with black holes, it could be another form of gravitational radiation generated by the dark matter itself at higher frequencies. And there are people trying to build detectors to go up to about 20 kilohertz to try to find that. Um, there, there, I mean, there are all sorts of crazy ideas about the dark matter if, it's, if, it, if it is a specific kind of matter uh, but the most likely sources of gravitational waves from the initial universe are the following. Um, and you have to believe a bit that this is, gets to be more fanciful the more you think about it. And it relates to the picture that's in, the, in this slide that is all the way here on the left and save me from having to talk about that separately. What it is, the way people now are thinking about it is that the universe started in inflation in inflation. In other words, that it's it started as a vacuum fluctuation. Those of you who like quantum theory or who hate quantum theory, you can't get around the idea that if there is a lot of energy in a very tiny region, you're gonna to have to use quantum theory. And that's what people have been doing with cosmology now. They think things started sort of the size of a grapefruit and that you could make a universe almost anywhere, which then leads to people saying, well, there may be many, many universes which many people don't believe because there's no way to check that. But nevertheless, right now, the universe, one way and most popular way that is of looking at the universe is there was a moment when the universe expanded by 10 to the 20 times in a time of the order of 10 to minus 23 seconds. An unbelievable, much faster than the velocity of light. And that, is a vacuum fluctuation came out of a vacuum fluctuation and that had accelerations in it that were so high that you got gravitational waves out of it. And the spectrum of that gravitational radiation has been calculated by a guy named Starobinsky in Russia. And, he, and we, if, if, if he's right, we know that you can't detect it with any of the things we're now planning. You would have to build a special thing called Cosmic Explorer. No, excuse me, a uh, big bang of it. Big Bang Observer, called Big Bang Observer. Or you do what's going on right now on that picture that's on the left of this thing. In other words, this is an experiment that's happening right now in the South Pole and also in the Atac will be happening in the Atacama Desert in Chile. This is to look at the electromagnetic radiation, that's of the cosmic background radiation, and look at its polarization. It turns out the polarization of the plasma that made that radiation is affected by a primordial gravitational wave background. If that's true, then they, we have a very small B-mode polarization, it's called, a very special, it looks like a spin, spin wheel that's buried in the polarization pattern of this thing. And people are going to be looking for that and trying to set limits on it. That will be, if they see something, that will be the discovery of the age. 
uh, because it'll show that this whole idea is right, that there was inflation, that there was this incredible expansion, and that there were gravitational waves that were generated at that moment. On the other hand, and that's what, that's, that's what this, this picture is about. Uh, on the other hand, there are, if that's not seen, there are ideas about building a system that is a combination of the ground-based detector and a space-based detector, which is this thing. And that, by the way, is now going to happen. The Americans, just about this, as old as LIGO, there are a space-based triangle, uh, interferometric triangle was invented called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And that was an American project at NASA, became highly rated, and then got too expensive for NASA, and the Germans took it over. And now the Europeans have taken it over, which is a pity. I would rather wish that the Americans had stuck with it. But, uh, and that is gonna fly sometime in 2030, in the 2030 decade. Uh, but it's actually being built. And uh, there is a model that was put up and tried to show that you could get the sensitivity. That was flown and it got the sensitivity. So it's well along. And so that is the next thing. And that would look at gravitational waves that are periods of hours, the periods of, well, tens of hours, hours, maybe minutes. But it still wouldn't be good enough to measure the gravitational waves from a primordial, Starobinsky-like uh, uh, gravitational waves from inflation. And you would have to combine the technology. If, if this experiment, the, the experiment to look for the polarization doesn't see this, there will be a push by the people working on the ground and the people working in space to put these two things together. And that will, it's called, that's called Big Bang Observer. That can just about measure the Starobinsky gravitational waves for real. In the meantime, there's another little thing which is not as important, but and people are trying to measure gravitational waves using pulsars. And that's going on right now also. So this is sort of a picture then of all the different things. This is the ground-based stuff at high frequency, space-based at hours, uh, using pulsars as detectors for gravitational waves. Pulsars are nova, are neutron stars that have very narrow spin frequencies. They, they, they have very tight frequencies for their spin and they can pick, you can pick them up all over the uh, galaxy. And you can use that as a way of measuring gravitational waves. Uh, and that has periods of about years. And maybe you can find some big black holes that way. And then this electromagnetic way of doing the electromagnetic polarization uh, by gravitational waves. These are the future. So that's the talk. Thank you. Rainer, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, Dick has a question, but I just want to say my brain is full. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good. You're Good quite time. welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I have one quick question for you. Um, it's been something on my mind for a while. Um, I think you said early on the electromagnetic radiation and gravitational, let's call it radiation or space time uh, movement um, are very similar. And I'm wondering if such a thing as a graviton exists, which would be parallel to the photon and yep. electromagnetic radiation. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, let me tell you why, I mean, everybody, what we don't have right now, and boy, I'll tell you, it's one of the big open problems in physics. I mean, I would say there are three open problems in physics that I know about, uh, and they are, what's, what is dark matter? Uh, what is the nature of dark energy, which is just as much of a problem. And the last one is, what is the real quantum theory of gravity? No. Those are the three. And, and a lot of people are working on the real quantum theory of gravity. It's a hard goddamn problem. And, the, and it, I don't know why, I, I don't know all the reasons why it's so hard. But yes, if there is a quantum theory of gravity, and we, we believe there has to be one, because quantum theory is part of nature. So we believe there are gravitons. Now let's go to the practical world. And can we see a graviton? And I, I don't think you can with the instruments we have. 
I'll tell you, the reason you can see a photon is because you have some very, very good high frequency sources. Now, for example, if the energy of a photon is H, Planck's constant times the frequency, uh, and if you have a gamma ray, you, you're almost detecting only one photon. So, you know, there's no question that you're detecting photons. You can see them as a single pulse. It turns out if we had a source of gravitational waves that was 10 to the, you know, uh, uh, 100, 100 keV or even higher, 1K, even 1 keV, we could possibly be able to detect a graviton. But right now, all the sources we have are at low frequencies. And our detectors are at low frequencies where we're dealing with tens to the, you know, 10 to the X with X to the being 20 or something like that, a number of gravitons all acting coherently. And it, it, was, there is some hope, maybe if you can make a very, very high signal to noise measurement, you can look for the slight granularity that might come about by having a, an explanation that uses the graviton rather than the uh, classical uh, uh, curvature field of Einstein's. Um, it's just a stinker to prove. And I don't think there's going to be a measurement of a graviton. Uh, I, had, I don't know the method. But everybody believes in it. <laughs> mm. Thanks. Charlie? Um, so, Ray, in uh, latest physics today, or maybe it was one, previous month, there's an article by Roman Schnabel. Yes, uh, I know. About, about squeezing, uh, squeeze, squeezing, light squeezing. Are, yeah. are you using light squeezing? Oh God, yes. Oh yeah. God, no. We wouldn't. We wouldn't be anywhere without it. We uh -huh. use light. We use light. We've been using. Well, let's be honest. Light squeezing. Uh, I mean, let me let me let me say how what what how you what what is the source of we. Okay, let me start over. Excuse me. What is light squeezing? I, 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 that's what I want to go back to. I want exactly. to go back to explain it. Uh, <laughs> What, let me give you, first of all, I think the best way of t that I can talk about it. Um, and that is that uh, the electromagnetic field has photons, okay? And the fact is that you take any system, any, like a cavity or uh, any system that has uh, uh, stores in the electromagnetic field has a minimum energy that it had, it can store. And that's one half of a photon. And that half of a photon is a noise. It's a virtual photon, but it isn't virtual in the sense that it makes no effect at all. In fact, that virtual photon does all sorts of nasty stuff. When, when people talk about spontaneous emission, in other words, that you put an atom into an excited state and then it decays, it's being driven by the fluctuations in the electromagnetic field that come from fluctuations in the electromagnetic field due to that half photon. So it turns out the electromagnetic field has a noise in it, as will a gravitational field will have a noise in it because of the nature of the quantum field. Now, there's an interesting thing, and this is a little subtle. You can get rid of that noise by doing something clever. And that's called squeezing. And here's the idea. Uh, let me give you the way the noise gets into the interferometer. Maybe that's a little too hard, but I'll just say it. And then uh, what, what happens is that the light, the, the, the light that comes in from where the detector is. In other words, there is quantum noise that comes in from where the detector is. It's not noise that you put there. Nature put it there. In other words, there's a, not every opening to an interferometer, wherever there's an opening into the interferometer to, 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 to the rest of the, vo the world, there is a fluctuating electromagnetic field that enters the interferometer from that opening. And the thing is that you can do something clever. You can convert that fluctuating field into a pair a coherent pair of real photons by using nonlinear optics. Optics that is, does not just give you a field squared and make a power. In other words, you get 
you can get field cubed and field fourth power and stuff like that by having interactions that are more complicated than just simple dipole interactions. And they are made and you can get various materials that will have higher order interactions that make nonlinear interactions. And that's what is, and here, let me tell you what is a squeezed field. If you wanna get rid, you can get rid of that noise that comes in the dark port of the interferometer by putting a nonlinear system there, which at the right frequency, which is oscillates at the right frequency and generates two correlated photons. One of them was derived from the fluctuating field. And the other one is by, by having been derived from the fluctuating field has properties that you can control so that the two photons together have no noise in certain characteristics. So let me tell you what they are. You, if you put a squeezer, which is this device, nonlinear device at the input of the, where the detector is, okay? What happens is that you will generate two photons and you can now have a choice how you generate them. You can generate them so that they have equal sidebands in amplitude or equal sidebands in phase. Those are the two limiting cases you have. Most of them will be mixtures of amplitude and phase modulated sidebands. Now, do you know what sidebands are? That's critical to this understanding. Sidebands are when you modulate light, you, you, when, you, when you make it, for example, you have a send light at a moving mirror, you get from that moving mirror, you get not only the carrier light that you sent at the mirror, but two frequencies, one that's a frequency above the, the, the carrier and a frequency below the carrier, that's at the, the difference frequency is the frequency of the motion of the mirror. Are you familiar with that? That's an important thing. You can modulate light and, and you can modulate light so that you make more light by wiggling a source or wiggling a mirror. And you can make then that mirror do either make it so that the sidebands, these two sidebands have equal amplitude or they have equal difference in phase. And so it turns out squeezed light is both of those things. You can, if you can make it so that the fade, there is no phase noise anymore, you've eliminated one of nature's sources of noise that came from that single photon, half photon. You no longer have that noise because you generated two photons now that have canceled the noise, the phase noise, you cancel it and it has become an amplitude noise, for example, which is not as important. Or you can do it the other way around. If you're troubled by amplitude noise, you can make those two photons have only phase noise and no, no amplitude noise. And that's called squeezed light. Two photon pair, a pair of photons generated from the noise that has an attribute so that it has no noise in one of those two quadratures as they call it. So I can't do any better than that. That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you'll, and you'll find that, that uh, the guy who wrote that article is an expert on this. They, they did squeezing of light. They did this on the interferometer, the geo interferometer, the one I pointed to in, in the Max Planck. Uh, and they did that a long time ago. What LIGO did is they made it practical. And that was all due to Nergis Mavalvala um, and, her, and her colleagues, uh, uh, Lisa Arsotti. Lisa Barsotti and Nergis were the ones who put together the squeezers. And we are right now doing something very interesting so that you have an idea. We're making a squeezer that does both amp reduction of the amplitude noise and the phase noise, depending on the frequency. In other words, we're doing frequency dependent squeezing. And that allows us to improve the noise in the detector at both high frequencies where phase noise dominates and at low frequencies where amplitude noise dominates. So we can get the benefit of getting rid of that quantum noise at two places, which are important to us simultaneously. And that's, that's the big change that's being worked on right now. 
brave. Um, I'm astounded how rapidly the field of gravity has grown. Yeah. Um, that seems really unbelievable to me. I remember when the, when the first wave was um, uh, discovered, which was a colossal advance, it, it appeared that we could now look at the universe through a different eyes. Right. But the, the, the quantity of the, of the signals that you get, the rate that you have, the expansion of theoretical ideas is just astounding. I can't think of any other epoch in, in physics where knowledge, the world has grown at such a rate. This is just a comment, my own personal reaction to it. Um, you may not feel that way. You're in the middle of it. You kind of blase about the these extraordinary advances, but it's an incredible story. Well, you know, it's not me, and you have to remember there is now a lot, a lot of very, very good people working in this. That that's why I tried to introduce you to the collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I realize that, but yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. ten years ago. They weren't there working. On no, it. they were not there. And because the field had been effectively tainted by Weber, that was the problem. Yeah. And then, and, and, and it took, look, to get around some of the rudimentary things. I don't know. I mean, you must remember Ron Drever. I, I, I oh, yes. And Drever had a fairly big impact in this too, but he was a very complicated man. But he had some very good ideas also. Um, and uh, so, it, but, but the initial the initial time was horrible. We, 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 it was it was horrible because of the competition between people. Eventually, once we got together, and Ron was not very good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he was. In it's, fact, that was one of the problems that ha that dealt to his difficulties at Caltech and also difficulties later on. Uh, Somebody event, wrote a book about this, didn't they? I hope not. <laughs> I think so. I think there was a book written about the management problems of LIGO. Oh, God. Well, management problems of LIGO were just unbelievable. Yeah, well, it, was, that, Ron Drever, it was Ron Drever's story. Uh, it may be partly. I, I may have been a part to that, but I, 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 you know, I, I could not go along with a lot of the stuff that Ron wanted, uh, mostly because, well, never mind. It's, it's complicated. Some of his ideas were superb. Some of his ideas were to him just as superb, but not working, not functioning, not functionable. And he couldn't easily distinguish. That was one of the problems. So we, we yeah. should probably wrap this up. Yes, uh, let's wrap Tony, it up, yeah. Tony, Tony has had a question for a while, and then Ted, and then maybe yeah. be done. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, in the current slide, when I look at the uh, space-based interferometer yeah. sketch, um, there seems to be a 60 degree elevation of the plane of the interferometer yeah and uh and it processes i guess uh with around the source in the middle uh why is that okay the guy who invented that is peter bender i don't know if you remember peter uh he's at jilla and and i think he's still alive i hope he is but he invented that in he and i were on a committee together and he invented that orbit uh, as a way of his, it was a major contribution he made. And then he did a lot of noise analysis on that. What that does is it makes it so you don't have to have any rocket power to hold the system into that configuration. It's a pretty stable configuration. That, that's something I, I would have not known, but that, that's what Peter showed. Thank you. Ted? Yeah, uh, excellent uh, talk there. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, we're gifted by having people in in the immediate vicinity who uh, you know have a real made fundamental contributions. And, uh, I I think it's uh, quite impressive. And I'm just wondering about the space-based interferometer because of the issue of uh, of keeping track of where the different mirrors are mm -hmm. 
there's so many sources of of uh, things that can in, interfere with the positioning of things out there because of you know all, all sorts of both particles bombarding things uh, you, know, you get hit by a cosmic ray that might might come yeah. up as some sort of a detection or something like that so it seems like that's a big leap forward if that does happen but uh, well let me let me try to make you let a little less worried okay um what you have to remember is that the spacing of those triangles are millions of kilometers mm. and not four kilometers. And so consequently what happens is because of that, the sensitivity of the displacement sensitivity, it's a, it's a heterodyne interferometer, that's what it is. But mm. if you convert that back into being a displacement sensor, it's about 10 to the minus 12 meters per root Hertz. Whereas the ground-based thing is 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19. And that 10 to the minus 12 is quite forgiving. It's the fact that you have these huge baselines. And I, I, I think the worry that you have, I had too in the beginning. I spent ha uh, a couple of months out with, with, I spent with, with, uh, with, with him at, at, at Jilla. And um, I found, I thought cosmic rays would kill it. It turns out that it isn't, there, it, it isn't enough. And uh, it, it, it is for the band, I'll tell you where it is. If you, and it's, I, I think it, it has a short, a short detection. And in fact, let me tell you, it's a cute story that Peter sort of called me one day and he said, you know, this, we, we were swamped by, we were swamped by noise, you know that. I said, no, I didn't know that. He says, well, we can't see above the, the, the binary white dwarf pairs that are in our own galaxy. That makes a terrible background noise. How will we, and then later on, he, he, he's right. Turns out, and that's in fact, uh, the nearer white dwarf stars will make a large background, but they're, they're not that many of them. So it turns out that has been analyzed. And I, I'm trying to tell you where to go. Uh, there's endless literature on Lisa. I mean, that was studied by the United States and now studied endlessly by the Europeans, but mostly by the group at Jilla. And I, I think if you looked under, uh, I'm trying to think where it is, I, I don't know exactly where to send you. It would be NASA, yeah, it would be the NASA descriptions of Lisa before they gave it up to the Europeans. They, there was, they were, in fact, it was a, 20, it was a 2010, uh, I know exactly now. It's a 2010 astro decadal that has most of those calculations and, and, and uh, the references to them in it of the noise. It looks very good because they have, they claim they can get the, the signal noises up to 100,000 on the black holes, uh, 10 to the six going around 10 to the five black hole, 10, you know, 10 to the five, 10, black, 10 to the five solar mass going around to 10 to the six will give them, to, you know, signal noises of 10 to the four or five. So, and, and so they, could, they claim that they can do unbelievably careful measurements of checking on Einstein and checking, uh, you know, and, uh, I, and, and I, the, the pity I think is that they're not sensitive enough to do the primordial gravitational waves. That, that, that I wish, well, you know, that takes a different instrument to do that. Great. I have, we have one question by John Rudy, and I just want to be sensitive to your time. No, go it's, ahead. Uh, it's 11.50. Uh, no, don't worry about it. I really appreciate it. I think we'll call John's question the last one, if you don't mind. I don't mind. This is, this is sort of an sort of a non-physics and more psychological question. You've been involved in this for, for many, many years, long before um, it was actually resolved that you could, that you could find these waves. And I'm wondering how you were able to go through those years, decades, as I recall, when uh, lots of people probably didn't believe that uh, they could ever be discovered. Well, look, I did a lot of different things in my life. You're all right. MIT wasn't very supportive in the beginning uh, because they didn't believe in it. I mean, uh, in particular, John Deutsch, who was dean at one time of science and then became provost he he 
and Francis Lowe, who I and brought some secrets home. What? And then he brought some secrets home to his house. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> then never mind. No, but John, John was the guy who actually sort of forced me into the collaboration with Caltech, which was the best thing that happened. I couldn't have done it myself, and I nor should I have. So, yes, but I'll tell you something. I and here I'll have the, I'll, I'll admit that what I really am. I'm a plumber, uh, <laughs> and I love to I love to wor work with objects, and I like to do things. You know, make things work. So I had pleasure all during that time, even though it looked like the boys didn't want to have me doing that. And so it, it didn't affect me much. I, I, I just, it made a little trouble. I had to find a way to get it done. But I would have done it, it had nothing to do with not finding something. I mean, there was, I think the, the joy of it was the experiments are interesting and the people I worked with were just really lovely. I mean, really lovely. I mean, all my students and postdocs and all the people I met later, even Drever, when he calmed down, was sort of an interesting <laughs> guy. Well, I, wanna, I wanna congratulate you for doing that. I, uh, one, of, one of my classmates, uh, Harvey Newman. Has been, oh, I know Harvey, oh my God, yeah. So, uh, so you know, I was in, in uh, Switzerland the day that they made the, the announcement at, at CERN. Yeah. And I've been talking to him about that for, I don't know, it seems like two decades. And he kept on saying, yeah, it'll come, it'll come. They'll, they'll find the Higgs. And I said, well, I, for your sake, I hope they do. <laughs> so, well, no, good. I'm glad some people had the, I think the big problem was keeping the money rolling. And let me tell you I, something. I, I, let me, let I, me say, let me, I was going to say, NSF, it seems to me, deserves a lot of credit. That's right. And I want to say that very carefully, loudly right now. It's not just NSF. It's Rich Isaacson of the NSF. It was a thing that they took a gamble. He made them take the gamble. He then helped us in the most disgraceful way, if you want to say, helped us. Okay. And he kept at it. And it's his victory. And, uh, and, 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 and Marcel Barden's, but mostly Rich Isaacson's. And so Kip and I gave some money to the, to the American Physical Society in his honor for people to win prizes in gravity. It's called the Rich Isaacson Award. I think he, uh, yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. And, uh, and, and I think people have to recognize that it, it was really something that the NSF took a gamble like this because most of the time they, they, would, get, they would get really hard over by Congress. Here they'd spent so much time and money on this thing and nothing has yet been done. I'm surprised that they, did, they didn't get Proxmire to death. You know? And physics is so expensive now compared to what it was you know, 100 or 150 years ago. Yeah, I know. No, no, you've hit, you've hit the miracle. The miracle is that the NSF saw its way through this. And now I'm trying to get the NSF, or I'm 90, uh, to try to get the NSF to look at the next development as, they, as theirs. I don't want the Europeans to be the only ones doing this. <laughs> So, so thank you very much on okay. behalf of uh, of our group. This was well, a, I'm very. I, it's a pleasure. It's a, it's a real pleasure to talk to you guys because you got good questions. And the, and and the guy who found the problem in the active system, thank you. <laughs> Ray, 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 thank, yeah. Ray, thank you very much. And, and I'm sure as you, as you're hearing, we we thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah.